Good morning. Welcome. My name is Judy Dalton. I'm senior pastor at First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Pasadena, Texas. We are worshiping today, April 3rd, 2022, and recording from the Dalton House. With us is David Dalton, my husband, and also through her recordings, Dr. Julie Durgis is with us. Please leave me a comment or a like or a heart. Let me know that you're worshiping with us too. It's always nice to know that we're not out there alone. I want to let you know that First Christian Church of Pasadena, Texas is dedicated to doing the right thing by our neighbors. And part of that is giving credit where it's due. That's why we have obtained the correct licensing for our worship service to record it and share it and even print out our worship guides. Our CCLI number is 439-1628. If you have a candle with you today, I encourage you to light it now as a sign and reminder that we are together even as we worship remotely and that no matter what, God is always with us. This is the fifth week of the Lenten season. We are so close. And today we're going to hear a story of love and devotion from the disciple Mary. As we will see, Jesus tries to prepare his beloved companions for his death. Oh, but you know how it is. Talk of death is like a punch in the gut to many of us. We'd rather believe we are invincible. We'd rather believe that our loved ones are invincible, that we're able to will ourselves into being strong. But we all know that's not always how the story goes. We are fragile. Our lives, like the plants in the gardens we tend, are susceptible to elemental dangers and have a life cycle of letting go in order to live. I invite you to pray with me. Holy One, lover of our souls, we call out to you. You know our tears and sorrows and you bear the seeds of grief with us. Open us this day to your comfort that nurtures these seeds into sheaves of joy, the simple, and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Let's sing together, Lord reign in me. Some of those praise songs are tough. 
<laughs> oh, it's time for our message for the children and with the children and sometimes by the children. So gather up any youngsters in your household and also pay attention so that you can share this message in your week with any that come into your path. With us today is Wendy Bear and also here is Coney Dog. Oh my goodness, you won't believe what these two got into this week. Yesterday, Wendy Bear and Coney Dog experimented with my perfume. Perfume usually smells pleasing, but a little goes a long way. Wendy Bear and Coney Dog didn't know that, and they sprayed about half the bottle on themselves. They smelled like a flower factory. I could smell them coming. The whole house was filled with the aroma and I had to give them each a bath to make them bearable again. Children, when we follow Jesus, we make the world a better place and people can tell that we're different, not by the way we smell, but by the way we live and the way we love one another. So let's remember that we are like perfume and we go through the world making it sweeter and more pleasing to God. Will you pray with me? You can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you for this day. thank you for this day. Thank you for our families. Thank you for, our families. Thank you for the church. For the church. Thank you for letting us. Thank you for letting us share your love. Share your love everywhere. Everywhere. We love you, God. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. Jesus spoke the words no one wanted to admit. He was not always going to be around. Oh, don't say that. So many of us have said to a loved one who speaks the truth about the fragility of life. Perhaps we get uncomfortable because it reveals the precious nature of the present moment, laying bare the beauty and the horror of it all. The indescribable pain we know we will one day face invades our senses like a pervasive perfume, inescapable. What if we stop denying the limited nature of our lives and breathed in deeply the scent of vulnerability. Let's take a moment of silent reflection. Hear this compassionate word from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Church, know that already God is offering us freedom from the need to avoid suffering at all cost of at the cost of denying the fullness of life. We are invited into the knowledge that Christ's vulnerability in life death and resurrection shows us the sacred nature of the heights and depths of sorrow and joy in our own life saga and know that despite our sometimes faltering steps in the name of jesus christ you are forgiven glory be to god amen our scripture passage comes today not from the gospel according to Luke, where we've been uh, the past few weeks, but from John's gospel account. We are at the beginning of chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for Jesus. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with Jesus. 
Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray Jesus, Judas said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Well, Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. May God add a blessing to this difficult and often misunderstood passage of scripture. And may we be blessed by it and changed for the good. My right hip has ached and acted up for years. Finally, last December, an orthopedic specialist told me why I hurt. I have end-stage arthritis in my hip. My bones are grinding against one another. Well, when I got the diagnosis, my first reaction actually was relief because I knew then that my pain is real. The diagnosis gave me permission to hurt. It gave me permission to disclose my discomfort, to prepare for my treatment plan, which is surgery down the road. I wonder, what do you need to give you permission to be real, to express your experience? It's okay not to be okay. After all, we all are fragile. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We're continuing to embrace the imperfections of life and faith in our worship series as we explore how we are good enough to receive God's grace and care no matter what. If you're like me and you know people whose lives were cut short by the coronavirus, maybe you have started like I have to reevaluate your priorities, how and where you want to spend your attention, your energy, your money. It's time, dear ones. It's time to acknowledge that our resources are limited and we cannot do it all, all the time. And we are good enough. We are finite. We are fragile. In our Bible story for today, we're on the verge of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We get that story next week. Jesus is in Bethany, which is right next door to the Holy City, and he's at his friend's home for supper. Just last chapter, chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and all the religious establishment is terrified that Jesus will further upset the status quo, and they conspire to kill Jesus at Passover. Bert Marshall writes, we have reached the turning point in John's gospel. At this halfway mark, John begins to tell the story of Jesus's final week. The raising of Lazarus has steeled everyone's resolve. The die is cast. There will be no more dialogue, no more discussions, no more signs and wonders. Uh, but I would argue that today's gospel reading is the story of a wonder. John describes an intimate family dinner with Lazarus reclining at the table and Martha serving, of course. And there's their sister Mary. Well, Mary does something unexpected. She takes a jar of very expensive, very aromatic oil, um, a salve, if you will, and she anoints Jesus. Disciple scholar Ron Allen points out that anointing the head would have been done to an honored guest or a royal person or also the Messiah was to be anointed on the head. But Mary, she anoints Jesus's feet. We 
you anoint the head, you wash the feet. We would be okay with her anoint, uh, washing Jesus' feet. That's a sign of hospitality in the rural country like, like Bethany. But to anoint Jesus' feet, that's surprising. It's a prophetic act. It signifies Jesus' imminent death. It's anointing Jesus beforehand for burial. Well, that's not the only surprising aspect of this act of Mary's. The oil she used was made of nard, um, a flower that was hard to come by, uh, grown in the Himalayas. And, and, and the amount that, of, that she used was worth a full year's wages. It'd be like us buying a jar of face cream for $65,000. The nard, the oil, was kept in a sealed jar made out of alabaster or marble, and, and, and thereby it could last for decades. But once you open it, the nard spoils quickly. It loses its pungency. You've got to use it in just a couple weeks' time. But Mary, she takes that jar, and she cracks it open and pours out oil on Jesus' feet. Well, no wonder Judas freaked out. What she did was wild and excessive. What she did was worshipful and beautifully extravagant, kind of like Jesus' love. Mary, she sees what the disciples either miss or refuse to see. That Jesus, even as he prepares for his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, is also preparing for his death. Mary understands how very fragile Jesus' future is. She anticipates his impending pain, torture, and death. And so she honors him ahead of time, offering him solace and encouragement with almost unbearable tenderness. In wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, Mary foreshadows Jesus' servant model of wiping his disciples' feet. The verb for wipe is the same in both of these stories in John, and it's, the on, and it's only used here in the entire gospel. Nowhere else is the verb used. So we're meant to understand Mary's act as foreshadowing Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Jesus is going to die. Jesus knows it. Mary acts on it. Jesus is fragile. So are we. And it is high time we cut ourselves some slack and allow ourselves to be nothing more and nothing less than we are. We are good enough. See, you don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus. Remember, that this story includes not only faithful Mary, but also unfaithful Judas. Judas is no less a witness. He is no less a disciple than Mary. John carefully points out that Judas objects to Mary's sacrifice out of greed. But Judas makes a good point that poor people need care. Hungry people need food. I want to take a moment to address Jesus' response. You see, more than once, John writes in his gospel, showing Jesus, uh, reference, he shows that Jesus references passages of the Old Testament, a phrase here, a couple of words here, and, and John trusts that we're going to recognize the source and fill in the blanks on our own, but the truth is, my brothers and sisters, we don't know our Bible that well, and we misunderstand. In today's story, Jesus references a passage from the Old Testament. He says, Jesus says, that we always have the poor with us. Let's be clear. This is not a statement of promise, but rather this is a statement of indictment. It's an indictment of people and systems that capitalize on those who are actually poor. See, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, which says, Since 
there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, since you'll always have poor with you, it continues with this. I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Jesus meant for us to understand that, yeah, the poor will always be with us. And so it's up to us to take care of them. We always need to feed the hungry. And you know what? We also must make time for Jesus. There are milestones when special acts of generosity, moments of extravagance and love are beautiful and fitting. Burying the dead is one of those moments, and Jesus, Mary perceives, is on the precipice of death. This is no ordinary dinner party. This is farewell. Life is fragile. We are fragile. Mary's act of love for Jesus fills the house with fragrance. It worked its way into the corners. It wafted under the table and over the cushions. It billowed into drawers and cabinets. It made its presence known. You do too. Church, your love for Jesus fills the world with fragrance. Your ministries of hospitality and healing release heavenly scents. Your cries for justice create a pleasing aroma. We are fragrant. We are fragile. And we are forever blessed by the one we follow, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to follow Jesus. If you want to be a Christian, leave me a message and I'll get in touch. If you're already a disciple of Christ, I urge you to put your faith into action. Recommit your life to Jesus today and read your Bible. I think it'd be great to read John 11 and 12. Our companion text, I read part of it today, is Deuteronomy 15 verses 7 through 11. And while you're out shopping or making your grocery list, Add small jars of jelly for our local food pantry, the Pasadena Community Ministries. And give to your local congregation or First Christian Church of Pasadena, Texas. Our mailing address and Venmo information are located on our Facebook page. As we make our offerings, let us receive beautiful music from Dr. Julie.
invite you to hold your phone if you give through Venmo or your check and let us pray silently for the building up of God's kingdom and the sharing of the good news that our gifts make possible. Let us pray. Today is my father's birthday. Happy birthday, Dad! Um, I'll call you later. One of the things my dad taught me that has stuck with me is that the person at the lowest place at the table is just as important as the person who sits at the head of the table. Dad taught me to um, go out of my way to uh, show respect and dignity to um, people who may be overlooked uh, in their jobs, janitors, secretaries, um, valets, people like that. Uh, and I think Dad is spot on. Here at this table, we are all servants of Jesus and Jesus is the servant leader extraordinaire Jesus comes not to be served but to serve Jesus washes our feet he gives his all he gives his life that we might know life abundant. So it behooves us to follow in his stead, to, to pattern our lives after his lives of service and sharing, lives of love and listening. We come to this table to eat and drink and remember, let us pray. O oh God, for loaf and cup we give you thanks. Use them to strengthen our bodies, that our bodies might be temples of your peace. That our bodies might... Fill this world with your love that we might, like fragrance, go everywhere sharing your good news. Amen. We remember the night Jesus sat at table with his disciples, how he took the bread of their meal and he blessed it, giving thanks to God. He broke the bread and gave it to the disciples, and he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a similar manner after supper, Jesus took the cup of their meal, after giving thanks to God, he gave the cup to the disciples and he said to them, This is the cup of the new covenant, my life poured out for the forgiveness of many. Drink of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Let us sing together, Be Still My Soul, two verses. Receive a blessing for when you're in grief. Blessed are you, dear, dear one, doing this holy work of suffering that must be suffered, of grieving what must be lost, of knowing the unthinkable truth that must be known. This grief can make you feel on the other side of glass from the world around you, a a force field of different realities separating you. Yet blessed are you in yours. For your reality is the one most seen by God who breathes compassion upon you even now. God who has walked this path and who leans toward you gathers you up into the divine arms of love. So rest now, dear one. You are not alone. And now may the God who loves all of creation, especially the grief-stricken parts, and Jesus, our companion on this crooked path we call life, and may the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise in surprising ways go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy. Amen. Um.